Hi everybody, welcome to Talk Gnosis. In our part two of our conversation with Bishop Timothy Mansfield, we're going to be talking more about the body. We're going to talk about how awareness techniques kind of feel in the body, and that's going to be a very useful conversation for your own spiritual practice. We're going to talk about Jansenism and the body-hating practices that have popped up as a result of that, uh, of, of that tradition. We're going to talk about the body and its relationship to uh, asceticism and various kinds of aesthetic practice and how those things happen. So uh, stick around. We're going to talk all about that coming up in this episode of Talk Nurses. So uh, I, I guess we'll stay on the topic just slightly, but what Father Tony was talking about, that you can have these profound experiences um, with this relatively simple technique of, of observing the self uh, and observing the observer. But um, I find it interesting. This is less a question than sort of, you know, give me your thoughts on. I guess that's the definition of a question. <laughs> so a, a lot of these techniques, both in the East and the West, particularly in the East, you're actually like using the body. For instance, you know, the simplest form of meditation that most people know is, is sitting and you're using your breath as an anchor. You know, it's not just a, an observing in the mind, right? Or you're sweeping from head to toe um, and, uh, and just sitting with the sense of body experiences, doing what seems to be a, a very simple sitting with the body. So what what's up with that? <laughs> <laughs> uh, before you answer that question, I want to... I'm not going to answer that question. I'm not even going to take that one. Right. Um, I, I listened to uh, Cory Doctorow's podcast, and he releases a lot of uh, his lectures. Um, and whenever he starts the Q&A portion of his lecture, he always says, remember that a long rambling statement followed by what's up with that is technically a question, but not a very good one. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm not criticizing. You're doing great, Jonathan. <laughs> I've even forgotten what you said, so that that's great. Jonathan, could you could you could you ask a more specific uh, version of that question that might be answerable? <laughs> the, the, <laughs> the fact that we can have this this connection between the body, the soul, and the mind, and and the fact that we can use the mind as oh, sorry the the body as an anchor to be here now, right? To right. have these profound spiritual uh, experiences, and and I think that this is kind of foreign to the Western idea, where again, if you do have the the ghost and the puppet, uh, everything is the soul, right? And the body is kind of the enemy. But say, by following your breath, or you know, doing, sitting with the sensations in your body, you can have these kind of profound insights. So I, I guess my question kind of is, is wondering about this this connection between the body and spirituality uh, and, you know, using the body in that way to reach Gnostic states, those kind of specific mm. ways. Yeah, look, I mean, I think it's a, honestly, I think the use of the body in spirituality is, is almost a universal globally. There are rare examples of spiritual traditions which try to um, pose that you're getting out of the body or that you're leaving the body or you're putting the body to one side. Um, most of those, I'm just going to, I mean, you know, lots of traditions have traditions of soul travel or switching bodies or whatever. Um, of being the soul being fundamentally separate from the body and to be treated independently of the body. Um, again, it's really modern in the West. It's um, you know, we see it in things that drive their their spiritual ideas from the Theosophical Society. It's quite common because it was a really popular idea in the 19th century because Victorians kind of hated their bodies. They kind of chained them up and bound them up and did all sorts of horrible things to them because they thought they were kind of vile. Um, Descartes' idea and Descartes' thinking made itself into, I think, what's what's formerly a heresy in the Catholic Church called Jansenism. Um, mm. It's a traditional traditional Roman Catholic doctrine says that um, the body is a beautiful creation of the Lord and that physical experience is a treasure. Um, just as it's considered in many other spiritual traditions. But ironically, when Gnosticism is criticized for a dualistic world-hating view, mm -hmm. you're much more likely to hear that coming out of the, the mouth of a, you know, J. Random Roman Catholic um, in the last hundred years. And the reason for that is this incredibly popular heretical view called Jansenism that emerges in France with Descartes and then gradually finds its way 
to um, particular monastic movements in Ireland, I think, and then makes it way, its way out through um, monastically run Catholic schools. And a lot of Roman Catholics in the last hundred years have grown up inhaling that view. Now, if you read official um, theological stuff from the Vatican, it's not what it's saying at all, but this is what a lot of people grow up with. And it's gone from it's gone from Catholicism out through Protestantism, and it's made its way from there into secularism. And this dualistic view is is everywhere through Western culture. But it's fundamentally really odd. <laughs> it has nothing to do with our lived experience, and it's completely disconnected from ancient Western spirituality. It's certainly got nothing to do with Eastern spirituality, except when you've got people coming from that dualistic viewpoint training as yoga teachers or meditation teachers, assuming that's what everyone's talking about, not really hearing how often we're talking about, you know, breath and the energy of the body and the necessity of and centrality of the body, um, and then reteaching this version of Eastern spirituality, which is fundamentally detached and about, I don't know, astral travel or something. Um, mm. Yeah, that's what's up with that. Jansenism is fascinating. I had no idea it even existed. I... Um, Listen to a talk by Father Thomas Keating, the founder of Centering, one of the founders of Centering Prayer, a couple of years ago, and he went on a tear about Jansenism mm. for a good twenty minutes. And I went, "For real?" And I looked it up, and yeah, absolutely, it's this plague. It's a uh, um, and it's because it's a grassroots heretical movement. Um, it's extremely difficult for it's been extremely difficult for the church to root it out. And once it gets into the school system, you're in big trouble. <laughs> what do you do then? Um, hmm worth doing some research on and the, the the influence of that the pervasive influence of that and of the cartesian view uh, as we've gone through the last couple of hundred years i'm i'm you know i don't know how many times i say in public it's been a very difficult 300 years for christianity <laughs> right <laughs> <laughs> but it really has been a really difficult 300 years yeah um you touched on this earlier, but um, kind of uh, numerous Western traditions, you know, from Paul uh, in the Bible to the Greek philosophers, they use they use the term, or at least what's translated as a term, they talk about the body and the flesh, and they use this as a shorthand for the passions. Earlier, we were talking about the passions, and they they talk about overcoming the body. Right, you have to overcome the passions to to have gnosis or insight or to be a good philosopher or to uh, you know have this connection to the gods or to the divine or to live the good life is this is this symbolism helpful and and what do you think these philosophers or or Paul was trying to say when they when they talk about overcoming the body and the passions well I think the yeah I think I mean there's a, there's a couple of things with that I mean it's absolutely the case that um, this is a common thing amongst neoplatonists um, and Pythagoreans, uh, it's a common thing in Paul, definitely. You see a common thing amongst the desert fathers and mothers, a lot of, um, you know, St. Anthony's trials in the desert. Um, the, there's an interpretation of asceticism, which is about um, kind of gaining power over the body, that you, you adopt a um, fundamentally oppositional view um, to what you feel is vexing you from the body, and you fight it. Um, I think it doesn't work very well. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one of the things we've, um, maybe this is a modern contribution that, that speaks against aspects of that ancient view, that when you take that, you know, you, we, we, have this, um, we have this physical being for the whole of our lives, barring very exotic accidents. Um, if you're going to adapt a, adopt a, an oppositional view, you know, if you're going to feel that your soul is at war with your body or your spirit is at war with your body, then you're in for a long war, buddy. It's mm -hmm. not going to go very well. Um, and some of the things that at least some of the, what some of the ancients seem to be at war against, are, are things like um, sexual desire or uh, craving for food, um, <laughs> good luck with that. Good luck <laughs> with getting rid of those. That's a long struggle. Um, so I think there are... Now, whether this is actually what they were teaching or whether they've been interpreted since, I'm not entirely super certain. Um, yeah. But I think getting getting into that kind of war with the physical passions is is kind of dumb and ineffective. Myself, in terms of my own... This is my own um, experience, you know, trying to, 
trying to live in my body after over the last 50 years. But um, I think we're, having said that, I think there is a value to disciplining mm-hmm. the body. Um, that middle uh, ground between it. hedonism and total asceticism. Right, yeah. right. So, I mean, asceticism means athleticism in Greek, right? Mm-hmm. An ascete is, a, is an athlete. So Paul uses the uses the image of an Olympic athlete. You know, you've, we must run the race. Um, I think he says in one of his letters. Um, so that's a kind of a kind of a different view. Like you know, an athlete doesn't hate their body, <laughs> but an athlete understands that they need to train their body in order to get the best out of it. Um, you know, a good athlete loves their body, treats their body with reverence, um, feeds it well, exercises it into health. Um, but there's an understanding that the body can get into and our relationship to the body can get into unhealthy states where we're allowing ourselves to get um, governed or driven by um, childish impulses, really. Things that I, are, have two, I have two liters of ice cream in my freezer right now. <laughs> and it's, it's for me. Sorry, so you're yeah. saying childish impulses. No. Exactly, exactly that stuff. Um, and they run us if we let them. They run us, yeah. you know. Um, we get run around the room by the various impulses that, that our body seems to want us to, to pay attention to. Um, I think, um, yeah, there's a, there's a distinction between uh, um, self-indulgence, this kind of self-indulgence and, uh, and self-criticism, like uh, operate as a duality, in, you know, and, and a lot of us are kind of put together that way where we, we on the one hand you know, go off and eat two liters of ice cream and then lie around all weekend watching bad television and, you know, never do any exercise and, you know, only read rubbish out of Facebook or whatever. So we self-indulge and then we feel terrible about it. So we go, oh, I'm such, a, I'm such an idiot. Why do I do all these things? I'm, I'm, just, I'm just such a terrible person. And let me, they're, they're let me great. break in here, actually. What, why is that? So, like, what is the, what, what's the motivation for somebody to to feel bad about that? Is it, is it a societal thing? Is there something innate in the human psyche that is, you know, that knows that it shouldn't uh, eat two liters of ice cream and then watch, to watch TV all weekend? <laughs> or is this something that we're just culturally conditioned to say, let's not do that? I think it's, a, I think it's well, the question's above my pay grade, but the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, I, I think it's a complex of things. Um, if you grow up in Anglo culture, so America or Australia or Britain, um, we have a pati- very particular culture around food that we're not meant to really enjoy it. It's meant to be something kind of um, nutritious. We're very obsessed with nutrition and about disciplining our, our use of food. Um, but I think every culture has physical indulgences that we think of, that we, we, we have culturally decided aren't good. Mm-hmm. Um, and then there's a level at which, you know, if you eat two liters of ice cream in one sitting, you're just not going to feel great. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a physical thing. It's not cultural. If um, I hit myself in the head with a hammer enough times, I will be up, un, upset about it, quite frankly. And it's yeah. quite true. <laughs> quite true. But that, so that, but that particular duality of, of kind of self-criticism and self-indulgence, this is the, you know, part of the fundamental functioning of the ego, right? It's, it's, mm. what, it's what keeps the ego structure in line. You sort of go too far in one direction, and you go too far. Thing kind of keeps you feeling ashamed and out of control, and you know, and then desperately needing to over control yourself, and you oscillate backwards and forwards wildly like this. And it's what it's how most of us live life. Astute Freemasons will uh, will recognize the, uh, a very interesting symbol that you just um, uh, <laughs> that, that you just mentioned, and I will. <laughs> I won't leave you all hanging. There's a there's a bit of, of Freemasonry that talks about keeping your passions within due bounds, and they use the the symbol of a circle in order to do that. Right. So it it, right. it actually it's it's a traveling around the circle and hitting on two different points around the circle and going back and forth. So. Yeah, I think uh, you know. So I think there's a you could make an an analogy to the two pillars of the tree of life and the mm-hmm. Kabbalah of, of mercy and severity. Sure. Right? So. Um, if you fall outside that, you're getting into self-indulgence on the mercy side, I guess, and then self-criticism on the severity side. The, so to, to kind of use your, your Masonic circle point, if you stay inside the pillars so that you're kind of in balance within the tree, then you're looking at something that looks more like self-compassion on the one side 
you know, going easy on yourself, understanding that it's difficult, understanding that you're doing your best, and on the other side, Mm -hmm. self-discipline. So you keep things within bounds. You don't go too far, um, too far to one side or the other. And that's, sorry, I've just done two pillars and then I've made it the wrong way. Anyway, you know what I'm saying? (laughs) We're we're Gnostics. We can change our symbol sets like that. (laughs) Totally. I'm just, you know. I will reverse your reverse all the orientations. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, what was I going to say that that does uh, that does remind me that we really do need to do a a show on self love because um, it, it's been something I've been thinking a lot about lately, and again, sort of reconciling some of these um, some of these thoughts about the body and uh, some of the classic thought in the West. Because I always think of the, there's a quote from the Desert Fathers: "Self love is is the beginning of all sin." Right? And I'm sure there's probably a translation mm-hmm. thing there, but it also does sound like something they would say. But reconciling mm-hmm. that my own experience and uh, living in the Protestant West with a bunch of people who are no longer Protestants who just walk around beating themselves up all the time over the smallest thing. Uh, but that is another show. It is connected to this topic, but we'll come back to it. Uh, Bishop, I did actually have a question um, more about asceticism where where so you you were kind of being a little critical of the idea about asceticism or or talking i mean you just talked a, a lot about it and talk about it being in bounds but it, it, do you believe it to be a um a relevant and important spiritual practice for for today's life like would would you personally as a as a bishop in the church not speaking as a bishop of the church but as a spiritual director would you recommend asceticism to anybody like where when and where and how can we use it in this modern context? That's a good question. I, definitely. I mean, it's an abiding, the, the sense of, um, of using a self-discipline spiritually and physically um, in order to achieve spiritual growth is, is an abiding tradition um, everywhere, everywhere. Every culture does it. I think, I think it would be crazy to say it's not worthwhile. Um, particular tools like fasting, um, like an intense prayer regimen. So, you know, traditional Christian monks will pray nine times a day, more in some mm. traditions, but nine times a day for regular. And some of those times are in the middle of the damn night. So they'll, you know, go to bed at dusk. They'll wake for midnight prayer. They'll go to bed again. They'll wake before dawn for prayer. They'll have a little nap. They'll get up and start work, you know. And then there's prayer all the way through the day. So that's intense, you know. So, um, the restraint of of sexual impulses and and trying to do more intelligent things with your sexual impulses um and so on this is asceticism and it, it's some um, it's incredibly useful i think the thing we need to be cautious about is connected to what you're saying about the prevalence of um of lack of self-love uh in our particular society so asceticism grows up you know the period we read about St. Anthony of the Desert, you, you're reading about a time when, you know, people um, people lived very sensually oriented lives. And a lot of what's going on when people move into religious life is the need to kind of restrain those sensually oriented lives. So the rich um, indulged in gluttony and avarice all the time and pride. Um, the poor offer, often indulged in, in other vices, you know, perhaps violence, maybe sex. Um, people lived, you know, extremely, um, extremely sensory oriented lives in ways that actually for modern people, it's quite difficult to get your head around. So for us, um, a discipline, a useful discipline might look more like as many people in, in, I've seen in the, the Gnostosphere on online, you know, we all, um, experiment with doing social media fasts from time to time where we stop engaging in Facebook or Twitter um, or we train ourselves to to only you know post or respond to certain things and not other things so that we're engaged in a kind of interior mental discipline rather than a physical one because our society is much more oriented towards the mental and intellectual than it is towards the physical and sensual um, but that idea of discipline is is massively important to spiritual life having said that in the context of a, of a culture where a lot of people really struggle with self-love um, it's, and often take in an attitude of, you know, because they've come through 
their own family background or an early spiritual background where they've internalized an attitude of shame towards their um, their physical impulses and their physical body itself and their physical body's needs and cravings, um, and particularly around things like sexuality, I think asceticism has to be used as a very cautious tool because when someone, it's really common in my experience for people to be drawn to Gnosticism when they struggle with self-love and it plays out in two directions because Gnosticism, people are drawn to Gnosticism because they think it's telling them that the world is, is awful and evil. Mm-hmm. Um, and when you, when you sort of sit with that person and talk a little more, it's very common for that also to mean I'm awful and evil and the extent to which I relent and become part of the world makes me an evil and bad person. And I'm only, so this is this whole concern about purity and getting away from the world and being separate. This is all tied up with an ascetic view, often. Um, so, I think I think asceticism is a massively important set of spiritual tools. At the same time, I can't unqualifiedly and unreservedly recommend it because of the number of people I've seen walk in the door of my, my parish or contact me on email um, who are coming from this place of self-disgust, disgust with the world, um, a concern, a kind of a feeling neurotic concern for purity i think um and for someone like that the prescription i think has to be very different it has to be more about love and it has to be more about compassion compassion for self and compassion for others and it has to be about um dealing with the that those fundamental sources of shame um i think asceticism for someone like that worsens their distances them i think and, and right. is a problem for their spiritual path. So that's my ambivalence about asceticism. It's not <laughs> negative about it. It's just, um, it's just. I think it's a, one prescribes it. It is strong medicine and must be prescribed carefully. Mm. <laughs> and often, often, um, you know, in the early stages of the spiritual journey, people are often drawn to the things which aren't going to do them any good. <laughs> <laughs> That does it for part two. Coming up in part three of our conversation with Bishop Mansfield, we're going to be talking about psychology and spiritual practices. We're going to talk a little bit about spiritual materialism and how people can abuse spiritual practices just in order to make themselves feel good. We're also going to talk about some spiritual practices and some traditions and some things that you can do that involve the body. And then we're going to kind of close it out with a conversation about queer issues in uh, Gnosticism specifically and how various kinds of world-hating or not world-hating dualism uh, affect the traditions of Gnosticism. So uh, if you enjoyed this episode, please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and to our uh, podcast at GnosticWisdom.net. And if you have... um, Also, you can find the link to the YouTube channel on on GnosticWisdom.net and all that stuff. So that's your destination for all the stuff that the Gnostic Wisdom Network does. And if you found this uh, information valuable and you want to see more of it and better content and uh, and, and more stuff that's interesting to you, go and visit us on Patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Gnostic. And you can support us uh, and every little pledge that you make uh, will help us grow and expand our programming and talk to more interesting people and stuff like that. So please do check us out there and we will see you all next week.